Nora? Yes, just I had to add it. I had to do the Zoom thing and say, okay, welcome comadres and friends. I'm Dr. Nora de Hoyos Comstock, national and international founder of Las Comadres para las Americas. The leadership team and I are pleased to have you join us for tonight's teleconference as we have just celebrated our book club, Quinceañero, 15. It's been our privilege to support Latino authors throughout these many years, and we look forward to the next 15, and we hope you'll be with us we are, would also like to extend a warm welcome to readers following us on our live Twitter chat. Tonight, please help us welcome author Kali Fajardo Anstein and Teresa Varela. Their interviews will begin shortly. And before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. Keep yourselves on mute because remember we're recording and we wanna have clear sound. And also, you may keep your videos on if you want, but if you've got your video on, don't move around a lot because it's distracting to others who are watching. Therefore, we suggest you put yourselves on speaker mode, but gallery will work just as well. Speaker mode will just make the person who's speaking the largest one on the screen and you won't be visible. If you've got any questions or comments, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them as soon as possible. So let's start out with our book club's history. Comadre Tess. Hola, I'm Tess Tobin, the submissions coordinator for the book club. Our first book club gathering was in July 2004 in New York in Comadre Maria Ferrer's apartment. After a brief hiatus, Nora Comstock re-envisioned and relaunched the book club nationwide to promote the work of a Latino authors to every book lover to bring our community to bookstores and to support our writers. We started our teleconferences in October of 2006. We are in our 15th year, or actually our 16th year now, of sharing works by Latino authors with all of you. We created the teleconferences and book club to entice everyone to read more Latino authors, to learn about Latino roots and the different perspectives on Latino culture and heritage. Our book club and teleconferences are open to all, not just Latinos. We are creating a space for everyone to explore the Latino writer's mind and soul as portrayed through the written word. We encourage you to join our local book clubs in your city or time zone. We have clubs in 12 cities that are meeting virtually. There is sure to be one that can fit your schedule. If your city doesn't have one, why not help us start one? For more information about our book club, visit our website at latinolit.com. So please invite others to join us. Ka Comadre Karen. Welcome comadres and friends to our January 2023 Zoom teleconference. I'm Karen Gonzalez, Assistant Coordinator for the Las Comadres and Friends Book Club, Denver Comadres Book Club Facilitator, and co-founder of the Colorado Alliance of Latino Mentors and Authors. Thank you for joining us tonight. I am delighted to introduce two special comadres I know from my hometown. We begin with our interviews with author of Women of Light by Kelly Fajardo Anstein. A uh, native of Denver, Colorado. Kali is also the author of Sabrina and Corina and is the 2021 recipient of the Addison M. Metcalf Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and winner of the West Book Award for Fiction. She has written for various newspapers. Kali holds an MFA from the University of Wyoming and has lived across the country from Durango, Colorado to Key West, Florida. She is the 2022-2023 Endowed Chair in Creative Writing at Texas State University. Interviewing her is Comadre Kim Montoya. Kim is also a Colorado native. She is a retired federal public servant, community volunteer, and advocate. She has been a member discussion leader of the Denver Las Comadres and Friends National Book Club since 2013. She has also been a judge for the International Latino Book Awards for the last six years. She loves to read, hike, travel, and take photographs of nature. Comadre Kim, take it away. Well, welcome, Kali. And thank you again for joining us this evening. Thank it's so you. wonderful to have you with us. 
Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you, Comadres, for selecting Woman of Light. And you, a few years ago, you also selected Sabrina and Corina. So thank you so much for your support. I'm happy to be here. Yes, I think uh, we also enjoyed that book very much. Uh, but first, I want to congratulate you on your first novel. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we want to say that we loved, loved your book. Many of us really enjoyed reading and discussing uh, your book. Uh, we love that it was from Denver, Colorado, because uh, of course we have Las Comadres here in Denver. So we love that Denver, Colorado was the setting. And we love the character development. And we love the name of the ancestors. A lot of us make comments about those very unique uh, nicknames, but I think some of the names that some of us might've recognized because we might've had a relative that maybe might've had the same uh, name, but there was some other names that were very distinctive and, and we really enjoyed um, talking about those names. And we also, um, some of our readers uh, thought you were an excellent writer and others got hooked on the, on the book immediately. I thought some of the feedback that I got when we were discussing the book. And then there was also some statements and sayings that you had in some of the chapters that really resonated with a lot of our readers. And if I could find one, I'll let you know which one that you know we talked about. So great job on your novel. Um, as Karen mentioned, I am a native of Colorado and many of the places that you mentioned in your book were very familiar, especially the mention of my hometown, Antonito. When I saw that name, I was like, oh my God, there's my hometown, she, you know, she wrote about it. So I, I was really excited when I saw that. Um, but anyway, we have several questions to ask and hopefully we'll get through most of them. So the first question, Kali, is uh, for those who have not read your book yet, would you please give us a brief synopsis of the storyline? Yeah, so Woman of Light is a novel that focuses on Luz Lopez. She's a 17 year old girl in 1933 in Denver. And she and her brother Diego live with their auntie Maria Josie. She's a factory worker um, and Luz, she does laundry with her cousin Lizette and her brother Diego also works in a factory but he also is a snake charmer. So everybody in the family has sort of a special gift. And the reason that they're in Denver is because when Luz and Diego were little kids, their mother unfortunately fell victim to alcoholism after a broken heart and she could no longer care for her children and she sent them north to live in the city. The novel spans one year and it goes through Luce's development as she gets a job working for a prominent attorney in Denver from a Greek and American family, but it also goes back to the older generations, to her elders. So her grandmother, Simodicia Salazar Smith, is a sharpshooter in a Wild West show. Her grandfather, Pitre, he's sort of the circuits master of, a, of this Wild West show. And we get a sort of a glimpse of the multi-generational story. And the book is based on my own ancestors and my own oral tradition in my family. And part of the purpose for writing this book is I wanted people to know about our histories in Colorado and in the American Southwest and to know why people like me even exist. All right, thank you. So what inspired you to write the book and how long did it take you to write? Yeah, so I began thinking of this story when I was still a young teenager. Um, I was inspired by my elders, as I had mentioned. So my auntie Lucy Lucero, she's the main character sort of impetus oh. for Luce Lopez. And I actually have Lopez's in my family line as well. And when I was young, I, we would visit my Auntie Lucy on the west side of Denver, and she would make this, you know, there'd always be green chili and beans and an old country crock um, <laughs> container in the fridge, and she would pull it out, and she would always tell us stories. She would tell us stories about her mother. Her father was a Belgian miner who had abandoned the family. There was an uncle who was a snake charmer. Many of my relatives had been openly queer for generations. And so she would tell us all these stories. And when I was still a teenager, I decided that I wanted to be able to write a novel that honored my elders and honored my ancestors. So really the novel took about 10 years to write. I wasn't writing on it every single day because I also was working on my short stories in Sabrina and Corina, um, but it did take quite a long time. Um, and part of that was because I had not sort of established myself as an author. Um, so I was working various jobs. I had a job like Luce where I worked as a secretary. 
I was a teacher. I was doing all kinds of things besides writing. So I wasn't able to just focus on the novel for many years. Okay. So uh, why did you choose to write a multi-generational story? And why did you choose the time period that you did? Is it because you went back as far as you could with your ancestors or what was- Yeah, so my, my mom now has traced my ancestors all the way down to like Matsuzuma. So like we can go much oh further back. Gosh. If we want, you know, we can go all the way down um, to the 1500s. But the reason I chose the time period I did is because those were the stories that my auntie would tell that were most vibrant. So she was a teenager in the 1920s and 30s. That's when she first fell in love. And that's when I could really see their clothes and the dance halls. Um, and the reason why I wanted it to be multi-generational is I meet a lot of young Chicanos who don't know their roots, mm -hmm. especially in Colorado. It's very confusing because the story of Latinos is, it's very diverse and it's this huge group of people, but we have so many different stories. So there's a lot of people that I grew up with that were very confused. Well, my family didn't immigrate here. We've always been here. How did that happen? What do you mean? Like, we're also indigenous, how are we indigenous? And so I really wanted to show the connections between the generations in order to help teach. And I really wanted young people to come to the novel and say that this is also a version of their own history. And so far I have met many young people who have read it. And I do think that they're understanding that it's similar to many cultures. Um, I was just living in Texas and San Antonio seemed to have very similar history as Colorado. And it just, I wanted people to know there's a trail. We do belong here and we have a long, long history in the United States, very long. <laughs> yeah, that is so true. A lot of us uh, don't know um, our history and um, some of us are doing genealogy, but I know a lot, it's very uh, challenging to do genealogy and really know about our story. And I know my sister-in-law has been doing genealogy on our side, and I think we can go back almost to 1600, but you know, there's, there's still a lot of work to do there too. Uh, one of the things, you know, when you talk about the multi-generation and just the time span, I was telling my group, uh, our book club, when we talked about it, that this book reminded me of, you know, the current uh, series Yellowstone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, because yeah. then they have a prequel for 1883 and then they have 1923. And so it kind of goes back and it kind of is telling you how it started and then now 1923 and now the current. And so your book reminded me of that because it goes back and forth and it talks about, you know, way back when you're the stories of your ancestors and then what 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 you're doing today, you know, with you and, yeah. as the author and trying to get those stories out. Well, that's such a big compliment because Yellowstone, I think, is the most watched show in America. Mm -hmm. So if you have friends who are fans of Yellowstone, you should recommend Woman of Light. <laughs> I will. I will. We will. Um, one of the things in our, our book club discussion, you mentioned the Lost Territory several times in your book, uh, but uh, we wasn't sure how could you. Well, we wasn't sure how you were defining the lost territory. Territory. So, can you expand on that? Because we, some of us, had different uh, ideas of the definition. What we thought you were, you yeah. were defining as that. So, I'm really interested in your definitions because I actually chose the words "the lost territory" because it has a symbolic meaning. Not only is it a territory lost, so essentially the Americans, in some versions of history, they stole the territories. In other versions, it was. Was, it was a traded equal thing, but many people don't agree that it was an equal trade. Um, so the idea of lost, to me, it means something that you do, you lose. So you lose your culture, you lose your country, oh. but also the concept of being lost, of being lost in space, of not really having your grounding. And I think that's why the lost territory sort of takes on a little bit more of a magical tone things that are happening in the lost territory, I always intended them to be more distant than what was happening in the city. And part of that is the name. I, I was really attached to seeing, I, I read a lot of uh, nonfiction and docu historical documents when I did research for this novel. Lots of research went into this. And I remember just seeing one sentence at one point that talked about the lost territories. So the territories lost to the Americans in the Mexican-American War. And I remember thinking I liked how much room that that term had. 
because it wasn't just saying the territory of the Mexican Republic lost to the Americans. It had a much wider metaphorical meaning. Um, but I would be I would be really interested to hear what the comadres thought of the, the words lost territory. Um, and it's given people who have no concept of our history a really like they are really confused. And I kind of like that because I, I think people are Googling like what's the lost territory. <laughs> and I, I think that's interesting because it starts the conversation about the American Southwest. Yeah. Well, I think you have a map in front of your book. And so yeah. I think it was like northern New Mexico, southern Colorado. So I think some people were thinking, OK, is that the, the, are you talking about the last territory with the states and how those states you know, became states and what was lost before that? Uh, some of them thought, was it the land grants? You know, people had land grants and they lost those. And then others, I think, thought it was just about the indigenous people. Like you mentioned, you know, uh, we, we yeah, lost all of that. those. All of those interpretations yeah. are 100% correct. So I love it. Like, I love that there were different ones <laughs> and they're all right. Yeah. Well, you kind of hit on this a little bit about uh, the character Luz, because we were curious to know how Luz was created. And we wondered if it was you or one of your relatives. And so apparently it was your auntie that you, you used to develop Luz's character. Yeah, so my auntie, her life is pretty different though. She ended up marrying very young and she had uh, many children. And unfortunately, several of her children died before adulthood. She never, uh, she never got to go to school past, I think, fifth grade. And she wouldn't have been able to work in a law office or anything like that. But she had all these friends who were Greeks and they would come to the baptisms and the big parties. So yeah, she's the main impetus for Luce. But while I was working on this novel, I was in my mid and early 20s when I first was getting the ideas. And I was looking around and I was meeting a lot of other young women who we hadn't really found our voice. We hadn't really found our self-confidence. There were things that were happening to us at work that we were afraid to speak up about. And I think it's, Luce kind of stands in for a lot of young women. She's not just, you know, some people think that she's too passive, but she just isn't there yet because she's 17 at the beginning of the novel. Mm -hmm. So I sort of intended Luce to represent a lot of young women I know on their journey to sort of self-actualization. Yeah, she, she was a really good character and, um, you know, she's just the coming of age. And so we see, you know, some of the challenges and struggles that she you know, has of the coming of the ages and, you know, the relationship she's got into, the relationship with her auntie and wanting to her own independence. But at the same time, you know, she had those family, you know, commitments and ties. So yeah, we, I really liked Luz. Um, let's see, um, how difficult was it to go back and forth within the historical time spans? Because I know you probably had to do a lot of research and, and write you know, the chapter as you were going back and, and seeing how Denver was at the time that you, you know, were writing in the book and what it looked like. And, uh, we want to know how 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 challenging that was. It was it was probably the most challenging aspect. I I at first I I tried to write it without any research and it was not good. <laughs> like it just <laughs> it, didn't have, it had no vibrancy. It was sort of flat. And then I got really heavy into research. I actually had an incredible thing happen. I, I got fired from a job in Florida and it was the, my one and only time of being fired. So it felt like, like very world shattering. But the same day that I had been fired, uh, the uh, Fort Lewis College called me and said, would you like a job? You had applied for it two years earlier. And I said, oh my God, like obviously oh, wow. like the universe wants me to go back home. So I moved back home to Durango in Four Corners and I was living in the lands of my ancestors. For the first time in my life, I was back to Southern Colorado. I wasn't even born there, I was born in Denver. And so I was able to do a lot of hands-on research and go and visit sites and drive around. And that's where I developed a lot of the lost territory. Then when I came back to Denver, I did extensive research at the Western Genealogy Floor at Denver Public Library. Some of the research was really difficult. I remember I, I sort of, I got a box that was filled with clan memorabilia from the Ku Klux Klan in Denver. And I remember that's where I got the, the description of the little baby in a clan robe is because they had a little baby clan robe. 
And I just remember thinking this ugliness is not that far away from us. Somebody donated this to the library. This was somebody's family that terrorized oh. my family. So the research aspect became very consuming. And I, I do hope that it, it translates in the book. And I hope that readers feel like they're learning from that research. Um, but I don't think I'm going to do historical fiction again for at least a novel. But I need to do something <laughs> that doesn't require so much research. Um, also, because I want to I want to write a little bit quicker. Ten years was a long time yeah. to work on a novel. Yeah, but you, you, you did it and then you came up with a very good novel. And so um, it's good to hear you say that because there's a lot of, of our uh, comadres that love books and they love reading, they love writing and some have written books and want to write a book and so it's always good to hear the author's perspective on, on when they write their book some of the challenges they have and some things you know that they need to consider as as they move forward in writing a book um, you hit on many issues in the book like domestic violence alcoholism dis overt racism discrimination was that your intent you, you know I, I follow the lives of my characters and both of my books now deal with these very difficult topics and themes. Mm -hmm. And that's because I treat my characters as human beings. And I would be surprised if there was somebody here tonight who does not know somebody who struggled with any of these issues. I would be really surprised because unfortunately part of being a woman, part of being a Latina, part of being a person in the world is that there are some very difficult things that happen to us. And part of what I'm trying to do with my books is show sort of a way through that sort of light. I wanna give light to people that have experienced these traumas. You know, I, I never realized that my great grandma like would have gone through an abandonment from her father and how that would have rippled down to my mother and that could have rippled down to me. And so when you start thinking about it and you build a novel around it, I think it also can help with healing. So when I raise my own children in the future, you know, I will talk about these things that my ancestors yeah. faced and I will say like we have we have ways that we can help deal with these things that when and if they happen and I hope they never happen. But unfortunately, I do come from a long line of women that have suffered, um, but they also had beautiful lives. So mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what I'm trying to portray in both of my books. Yeah, and it's unfortunate that even back in the day, they they had to experience these things and until to, and still today we we still are experiencing you know the same things unfortunately yeah. we, we we think we've come a long way but we really haven't uh mm -hmm. in, in those in some of those respects um what takeaways do you want your readers to walk away with when they read your novel well the biggest thing that i want is i want you to be entertained i want you to read and i want you to read quickly and i want you to stay up all night and tear through the pages and then I want you to be moved. And I want you to think about these characters for a long time. And I want you to learn about the history of people in Colorado, Northern New Mexico, and maybe think about your own family history in a new way. Um, one of the most inspiring things I've heard from people reading this novel is that they're going to look into their own past, especially mm -hmm. from the younger generation. They haven't even mm -hmm. considered this. And they say, oh, I'm gonna talk to my grandma. I'm gonna talk to my grandpa, you know? and so. That's what I really want people to take away. And I just hope that Woman of Light keeps spreading to other people and sharing those gifts. Yeah, well, I think your, your story is an inspiring and I think um, that, that you will accomplish that. I think that readers will wanna, uh, once they read your book, they're gonna want to look into their own family history and, and talk to the relatives they have that are still living. Uh, you know, I come from, my mother comes from a, fa a family of 14, and there's oh. only four left. And so um, I had an aunt that I just would sit down and talk to because she knew all the history of my family and the stories. And I thought about writing a book too, because she had some hilarious stories to tell me <laughs> about my, my other aunts and uncles. Um, so what is your next project, your next writing project? Will, will there be a sequel to this book? There might be in the future. It's not coming right away. Um, I love the question about the Mary Saul, the, the very beginning. <laughs> I said, well, she stuck with people. Um, there might be. I, I do want to write a novel based on my family history in, I know, the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. I find that period really interesting. That's when I was born in the 80s. 
Um, and that's also sort of when my family began to get educated and move into the middle class. Um, so that will be coming. I'm working on short stories right now. I'm working on a new novel that's actually set in the future. So that's sort of a, a change for me. But I also wrote the introduction to Willa Cather's Death Comes for the Archbishop, that, which will be published later this year by Penguin Classics. Oh, and that God. novel is about two French priests in 1848 who come to New Mexico to try to change the archdiocese over from Mexican rule to American rule. And I wrote the introduction about how, you know, this is really one of the first times that I've ever seen my family history discussed by a great American writer. Um, published 100 years ago. So look for that. That'll be out later this year. Uh, but I, my whole ambition with my life is to keep telling stories and to keep publishing novels. And I just, I really want to thank all of you that have read my books and continue to read my work because I wouldn't be a writer without readers. Well, we were, uh, it was just an honor for us to be able to select your book to read. And I know that many of us enjoyed it and we enjoyed uh, your short story uh, book too. Um, I believe it was uh, the collection story of Sabrina and Karina. So I think I'll, we, we chose that book too. So we, we, we read that book as well. So, but we wanna thank you again for spending time with us this evening and, and sharing um, your story in the book, but also um, how uh, how you came about in writing the story and, and sharing your family history with us. Well, thank you all so much. And thank you for everything you do to support Latino writers. And, and before we go, I, I, do want to, I do want to read one of the sayings or statements that you read in the book. So I think this is kind of a good way to end our interview. Is that sometimes we go through things in life that are so hard and ugly. We'd rather forget than remember, but now I can't remember very much. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Um, we'd rather forget the, than remember, but now I can't remember very much at all. I regret that now. Um, you, that was something that was written, but there's no regret with you because you're getting your, you got your stories you know, in this book. And so uh, we need to not any more regrets, you know, so. But that was a, one of the sayings that I think people really uh, resonated with some of us. Oh, thank you all so much. And I hope you all have a beautiful night. And Teresa, I hope you have a wonderful interview. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Comadre, Kali. Uh, our second interview is Teresa Varela, uh, author of Murder and Red Hook, uh, Daisy Muniz Mystery. Uh, Teresa is an award-winning New Yorkan author with a PhD in nursing research and theory development from New York University. When she's not writing, Dr. Varela is working as a psychiatric nurse practitioner at a New York City shelter for persons living with severe mental illness. While engaged in the educational process, she realized that her true calling is as a novelist and poet. She was born in Brooklyn, New York, and has lived there proudly all her life. Her published novels are Murder in Red Hook, a Daisy Muniz Mystery, Coney Island Siren, Nights of Indigo Blue, A Daisy Muniz Mystery, Covering the Sun with My Hand, and Answered by Silence, a collection of poems. Interviewing Ter Teresa is a comadre, Tess Tobin. Tess is the submissions coordinator for Las Comadres Book Club. She is the former president of Reforma and has been a proud member of the book club since 2007 and enjoys promoting the work of Latino authors. Take it away, Comadre Chess. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Teresa? Yes. How are you? It's so nice to see you. It's so good to see you, and it's so good to be here tonight and to yeah. see everyone. It's very it's exciting. Very interesting, the previous interview. They're both from Colorado, and I have to say I'm a native New Yorker also, so I could relate to your story. I'm not from Brooklyn, but... Uh, I, I, I swear I was in that brownstone at some point and I just knew everything that was happening. But anyway, we're so happy to have you. Um, for those that have not read the book, can you give us just a brief synopsis of the story? Well, this is the second published installment of the Daisy Mysteries. And um, she's a, I'd say about a 28 year old woman who is um, newly sober. 
She is learning life. She is um, open to spirituality, to her intuition. She's um, something that she loved always was tarot reading. And um, she's also getting ready to be initiated into Santeria. And um, so she's just like full of life, full of, it's like a, like she's being reborn at this point after um, drinking for, for many of her younger years. And um, one of her best friends is murdered and he lives in the building with his partner, Jose Rubio um, lives with Jose. And, and basically this story is where she's trying to find out like what happened, who did it, why? Um, because he was so close, you know, they've been friends since early in um, high school. And, um, and it just, you know, shocks the whole, the whole group of them. And not only do they have to deal with, um, you know, the murder, but also, you know, dealing with Jose's family, who, I mean, um, Rubio's family, who comes in from um, South America, and, you know, the business with um, accepting her son who was gay and, and those sorts of issues are in there also. Yeah, very good. Um, Ash, Ash, I must, I must um, add in though about her boyfriend, um, you know, Detective Rodriguez, who we met in the first um, installment and her, she's starting to um, figure out how they may work. because She's right. got the news that she hadn't been prepared for. Right. Um, I feel, you know, Knights of Indigo Blue was the first installment, but I do feel if people haven't read that and they pick up Murder in Red Hook, they'd still be able to be engaged in the story. So, but anyway, um, how did you come to write these two mysteries? How, where, where, where did it develop? Well, I was always a lover of mystery um, since being a teenager, you know, um, Actually, since being a child, you know, I, I started out with um, Nancy Drew, of course, like many of us did. And my mother always had Agatha Christie books around. And um, and then I just always sought them out. So I, I loved mystery. And um, after I finished my doctorate, I went for a creative writing course because, you know, as, as in my bio, I, I did a qualitative study in um, NYU for my, my dissertation, which was the experience of people with AIDS who practice Santeria. Um, it was something that I had become interested in in the community, um, this Orisha tradition, this religion. And um, you know, the teacher had, had what well, my chair said, you're, you're really great with your poetry, with your playlets, like, you know, this is where your strength is. Although I was actually learning, you know, how to write research, which is the funny thing about it. And um, so then I took a creative writing course afterwards. I had finished my PhD and then I went back to Hunter College to take creative writing. And um, the teacher had us write something, a short story based on a, um, a fairy tale. So I chose um, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And um, from there, I developed Daisy. Daisy, who you know, one bed was too hard. Her life was just too hard. The next bed, her life was just too, it wasn't grounded enough for her in the relationship she had gotten into. And then the the third um, bed was something that was just right for her where she realized that she was drinking and that she had to stop that. And she had to really look at herself to find out what it was for herself that was going to um you know, help her to fulfill herself as as the woman that she she was. So, at that point, you know, I had started to write, and um, and it all like gelled. It all came together between the mystery, this Daisy character who had popped up on my screen, and um, and that's where it started. Oh, that's great. Um, I've read that you believe your characters give you their stories. Can you tell us what you mean by that? that they talk to me, <laughs> you know, I, I can't, um, I can't plan a novel. I've tried, believe me, because I'm on the third installment right now. And I, and I just, I just cannot plan an, uh, I'm a pantser is what they call it, but it's also a, an intuitive writer. So um, basically my characters tell me what to write and I sit there and um, it's almost as though I'm reading a book as I'm writing, because I'm finding out more and more about the characters, more and more about the storyline. 
you know, for instance, this morning, I started to write some lines um, before I went to work. And I felt that, that just that, that emotion of, I wonder what's going to happen next in the story, because I don't really pre-plan it. So it's just basically listening to them. And then, you know, the editing and all of that comes later, like what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. And that's where my work comes in is to just kind of sit there and let them talk. Okay, great. Um, Daisy has a lot going on in your life besides solving the murder. Uh, Daisy believes she is clairvoyant. Can you tell us about her powers and how did you choose to write this into her story? Well, um, that's something I'm very familiar with is um, an intuitive life is the, um, you know, the religion of Santeria, um, being a spiritist. I myself do readings. I myself read, you know, do astrology charts. So that's something that I'm also doing. Um, you know, I think it went from, you know, being a, a psychiatric practitioner to really owning myself and, and those spiritual gifts that I have. And, um, and then Daisy hadn't, you know, came forth with these gifts, you know, but she's just learning. She's just learning because she just, you know, she's been in the bottle for so many years, although she's, you know, she was in her adolescence when she started to, um, to drink so that for her, she's still second guessing herself. She's still not really listening to her intuition, but she's being encouraged and the people around her are encouraging her to, um, to really accept herself and, and the gifts that, um, that are innate to her, which is her intuition, which is her clairvoyance. Um, which is, you know, something that so many women have. And, um, you know, we need to celebrate those gifts, those characters. Yeah, I, I love Daisy. There's so much going on in her life, though, you know, with the, everything around her. So I guess with your, from your own experience, is this why she, she uh, is seeking the Orisha tradition in the story? I mean, she's, her spiritual side is from your experience. Is that how it ended up? You know, that's, you felt familiar writing about it? Well, Daisy wanted it. I mean, Daisy told me it in the writing. I mean, because I've written other books and other um, characters that were not into, you know, learning about this religion or in practitioners of the religion. This just happens to be Daisy as a um, as a character, you know, as the protagonist. Um, I'm writing something else now, and uh, you know, a different story altogether. And um, the religion isn't in it at all, but this just happens to be part of Daisy's um, experience. Good, good, good. Um, there's a lot in the book about self-care, relationships and community. You know, for one, the relationship Daisy has with the people in the house, you know, unfortunately they lose Rubio, but she's very close to Jose. They're very close to Marge. Um, and there's a lot of other characters. Um, so would you say that these are the underlying themes of your mysteries, this compassion and empathy that they're, they're, they're looking for community, the characters? And Yeah, I mean, relationships are important. Relationships are important for all of us. And I, I think especially for Daisy as a, as a recovering alcoholic, you know, that the, um, you know, resounding or one of the resounding um, you know, vibrations or dynamics in, in an alcoholic's life is the feeling of loneliness, you know, of being alone, of not having other people around them to help them out. And she's really, you know, she has these relationships already. And in fact, Jose is the one that um, brings her into a, a recovery program. Um, so it's really important to her. And she's gotten out of relationships that were really unhealthy for her. So, um, so yeah, and, and they love each other. It's like a, you know, a family, like many, many people say that, you know, we're, we're not close to the families that, that, you know, we were born in, but we've actually had to cultivate relationships and families um, that, that we can trust, that we can be open to, that we can, you know, honestly show our true selves. Yeah, and I guess now that she's um, sober, she's just learning how to trust people. And, you know, like, as you said, she was in a fog for so many years. So now just building these uh, relationship is in, and she's trying her best. So also you bring in the idea of sobriety and they go to meetings. That seems to be a big theme, too. Is that is that from your work or is that just another part of Daisy's character that came through? 
Well, you know, I know that I've worked in substance abuse um, for many years um, before I went into the shelter system. And then I also worked in the shelter system and substance use programs there. And, um, you know, in the shelter system, we, you know, I, I see so many. So there, this definitely flavors it. You know, I see so many young women who don't realize that they have a problem with alcohol, that they um, say, oh, once I get my apartment, I'm going to be okay. But the underlying problem is still there. Like, how do you pay your rent? How do you work, um, you know, consistently? You know, all those problems with relationships, people lose relationships because of alcoholism. But there's such a, a, a number of people who aren't aware that those are the problems that they're that they're um, having because of the alcoholism. They think that the alcoholism that they, they don't even think that they're alcoholic, but they say, oh, this drinking, these drinks are going to make me feel better. And now there's a lot of, you know, with the weed being legal, which, you know, some people can use and some people can't. And a lot of the people that I work with, they can't, but they just don't get the, the message. So I, you know, I just wanted to make it accessible for, for younger people to say, you know, I'm vibrant, I'm alive. I, you know, I want, and I want relationships. I want to have a nice job. I want to have, you know, a nice home, but there's something wrong here. And what that might be is the alcohol. Right. And that's, that's the big challenge to, to, to recognize it and, and be able, but I, I, as I said, I love Daisy. I think she's trying really hard. You know, there's a lot of temptations out there and, and everything, but you know, she's, and you know, you, she talks to us and tells us, you know, how hard it's, how hard it is to be sober after so many years. So that's good. Um, so here we have her relationship with detective Rodriguez, uh, poor Daisy finds out that, you know, he's married and he has a son and everything. So how do you think, what do you think is going to happen with her, with him? <laughs> yeah, I don't know where it's going to go yet. I know that it's actually a little girl and she's... Oh, um, it's a girl. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. She's, well, you know, I went back and forth with the, with the boy. So you may have picked up on that psychically yourself. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so it was a surprise to her and, and she cares for him, but she doesn't know how much she cares for him and, and how much she needs to care for herself you know, at this point, to be in a relationship with someone that, you know, you're very attracted to when things seem to click. And then there are secrets behind that, you know, and, and she's kind of trying to gear away from the secret of life as much as she can and, and um, you know, work on her emotional sobriety. You know, it's not just about putting down the drink, but emotionally, like she, you know, has this, this quick fling with, with the guy that she meets, and then she's horrified at herself afterward. But those are all symptoms of, of the disease she has. So um, right now in this third book that I'm, I'm writing, she is with Detective Rodriguez. So let's see where that goes from there. Right, right. Um, I myself enjoyed and other members of the book club reading um, Murder in Red Hook because apart from wanting to solve the murders, we also found the characters to be real. I felt, I felt like they were real. I think Daisy's courageous. I think she's strong when trying to face her demons and the dilemmas of life. Was this your intention when, when developing your protagonist? I think there's a feeling of hope there that everybody is learning how to connect and, and, and that's making them get through their daily life. So is that something you were thinking of, you know, cause it's a mystery and a murder and, you know, you have the whodunit part, but I mean, you would really develop the characters, I thought, with that feeling of- Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that might be a reflection of, um, you know, myself. I don't know if so much that I thought about it, but I know how important relationships are. I know how important it is to, to care about people and to hope you know, to hope, to have hope, to give hope, you know, to, to have some kindness, to have some compassion for each other with, you know, what's going on and to be able to listen. I, I think that that's so important just in life in general. So I think that that's really what, um, what flavored that in the book. Right. It comes through. Now, I'm not sure. Are you still working? Are you still working? I am. I am. <laughs> So yeah, not yet. Um, 
Yeah, no, I, I work remotely. I work remotely. Um, at, at Right now I'm working at three different shelter systems. I mean, oh, wow. the same corporation, but in three different spots. So I do remote um, telehealth. Oh, okay. I was laughing with a client today because he was talking about having um, vegan food, right? So it's plant-based Monday food. And then he's seeing me remotely. And, you know, we said we're really futuristic here, even in the New York, you know, city shelter system that we're in the age of Aquarius. So it's really so, um, you know, it's divine, it's fun, and, and it's hard work. So. Yeah, we thank you for that. Um, so how do you find time to write? What, what's your writing style or how, you know, does, it must be a nice relief, I would think, with such a demanding job. It is. It is a good relief. Um, it is a nice relief. I write when I can. I, I think it's just sitting in chair. I mean, I do have an office here in my home, a couple, right? I have a, a desk table on the porch in the in the warm weather. Um, but really it's about putting that that um laptop opening up that laptop and sitting down and 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 allowing the voices to come through because there are always things to take care of. There are always things to do. And I think that's probably why I'm not writing as, as rapidly as, um, you know, as I think I should be, you know, because, you know, as I, I mentioned in the beginning, in the, the first page of um, Murder in Red Hook, that my, my father had gotten ill with Alzheimer's and I thought I was gonna be writing this book and I was gonna finish this book that was next on my agenda. But, you know, my my God had a different agenda for me. It was like, no, no, you're going to take care of your dad for a year or so. So that threw me back. Um, so I guess, you know, again, relationships are are the main thing. Right. And then the, the writing comes later. But it's really sitting down, um, you know, like they say, putting my butt in the chair and and writing. Right. Right. Good. Uh, what's coming next? Are we going to get another uh, Daisy Muni mystery? Yes, I'm hoping to have, I'm fingers crossed that um, I will have it by Christmas. It's um, Deadly Little Christmas. It takes place around Epiphany. And um, so that's one. I'm still working on my, my Graciela La Gitana Oracle book, the handbook that goes with that. That is taking me forever, but it's still, it's still in the works. And um and there's another book I'm writing, which is uh, about an astrologer, a, a young woman, an astrologer, and and her her partner with mental illness, and how they um, they they deal with that. Um, so I mean, I have different projects right now, but you know, I, I was listening to a, a podcast the other day where it says, you know, if you work on different things at the same time, it helps keep your your work fertile. It's kind of like gardening. You know, sometimes you sow, sometimes you reap, and and that my my fields won't become fallow. So so that's why I'm working on different things. Oh, good, good, very good. So um, I don't know. We just would like to thank you so much, Teresa. You know, I really think you've achieved telling a great story with great characters. And um, Sorry that they lost Rubio in this in this book. So um. I, I was sorry too. Believe me, Tess, I was so sorry. I was horrified when I when I realized that he was gone. <laughs> right, right, right. But we look forward to what comes next, and we wish you. We we thank you for your work and and uh, both as a writer and in the field. And so thank, thank you. you so much, Teresa, for joining thank us. Thank you so much for having me. I totally enjoyed this tonight. Thank you. Oh, comadres. Another wonderful teleconference with our authors. Thank you so much to Kali Fajardo Einstein and Teresa Varela. And Teresa, I mean, I, wow, it makes me feel like if I sit down and start typing, will, will something come out that's worth others reading? I don't know. You have inspired me to think about writing that way and maybe even taking a creative writing class. How about you all, Comadres? You all interested in that? I'm kind of enthusiastic about the idea. And we also want to thank the publishers One World and Imprint of Random House and Pollen Press Publishing for their generous donation of books to our early registrants. Thank you as well to our interviewers, Comadre Kim and Tess. Y'all had great questions and commentaries on the book. Thank you so much for that. 
and our audience for taking the time to join us tonight. And to those that submitted questions, mil gracias. We'd also like to thank all our volunteers without whom this book club and all the associated work would not happen. You know, the small number of us could not get all this done. So thank you to the volunteers. And please remember to support our authors by writing a review of their books on sites like Amazon, Goodreads, Barnes and Noble, et cetera. And let us know you did it so we can read them too. These reviews carry weight for the publishers as well as other readers. Buy books to support our authors. And if you, your library doesn't have a book that you want to read, we'll ask them to order it. Let's see, I lost my place. Um, and please attend our virtual book club meetings as well. Bring a friend or two. It's good to be face-to-face -face sharing these experiences that our authors share with us. So I hope you'll join us. There's also an important note. Our book club is open to men and women, Latinos and non-Latinos, all are welcome. So feel free to invite others to join us. And also these podcasts and teleconferences are available on our YouTube channel. And it's uh, YouTube um, slash C, Las Comadres para las Americas channels. And each word of Las Comadres, um, but uh, those are all capitalized, okay? So remember each one of those is capitalized. Let's see what else. Um, our February, February books are Andale Prieta, A Love Story to My Family by Yasmin Ramirez, Twice a Quinceañera, and it's, that's a delightful second chance romance by Yamil Sanchez Mendez. Again, thank you all for your continued support of our book club and Latino literature. Please join us in celebrating our quinceañero throughout the year by buying books and supporting Latino authors. Good night to all. And as always, read Latino literature. Thank you, everyone.